Thank you for joining us today's event. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge for those of us in Australia, we are all on the traditional lands of First Nations peoples. This land was never ceded. I particularly want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. And it's also where I'm joining you from today. I'd like to pay respect to elders past and present, acknowledging them as traditional custodians of knowledge for this land, and also acknowledge the traditional custodians from wherever all of you are joining us from, including our panellists. My name's Verity Firth. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Social Justice and Inclusion here at UTS. And it's my real pleasure today to be joined by a distinguished panel of speakers, Dr. Linda Steele, Kate Swaffer, Yumi Lee, Bill Mitchell and Teresa Flavin. People living with dementia in Australia have been subject to significant harm, including violence, abuse and neglect in aged care. A new report, Reparations for Harm to People Living with Dementia in Residential Aged Care, finds that government, the justice system, healthcare and aged care providers are failing to recognise, redress and repair this harm and hold those responsible to account. With more than 480,000 people currently living with dementia in Australia, it's vital to bring awareness to the need for reparations, as well as changes to policy and practice around access to justice. Our panellists today have all contributed to the report, which we're linking to in the chat now for you to access. It's my honour to now introduce our panellists, Dr Linda Steele, Kate Swaffer, Yumi Lee, Bill Mitchell and Teresa Flavin. Dr Linda Steele. Dr Linda Steele is a socio-legal scholar whose research focuses on the role of law, human rights and transitional justice in the perpetration and redress of violence against disabled people. She is currently leading a program of research, Truth, Justice, Repair, through which she is exploring how we reckon with and repair the harms associated with violence, institutionalisation and segregation of disabled people. Welcome, Linda. Kate Swaffer is an independent researcher and award-winning campaigner, international speaker and author. Her work focuses on human rights, disability rights and desegregation and deinstitutionalisation of people in residential care homes. She also lives with a rare form of younger onset dementia and continues to work locally, nationally and internationally. Welcome, Kate. Yumi Lee is a peace and human rights activist and CEO of the Australia Older Women's Network, New South Wales. Her work focuses on advocating and lobbying on issues impacting older women, including housing insecurity and homelessness and violence against older women. Recently, the Older Women's Network New South Wales engaged in the Ready to Listen project, aimed at raising awareness of the shocking level of sexual assaults that take place in residential aged care. Welcome, Yumi. Bill Mitchell is a principal solicitor at Townsville Community Law. He has written and presented extensively on the human rights of older persons and has been involved in program service design in diverse areas, including elder abuse and disaster legal response. He has been an expert contributor and presenter to national, regional and international processes on human rights issues. Welcome, Bill. Teresa Flavin is an activist and advocate for the dignity and human rights of people living with dementia. Teresa lives with younger onset dementia and has worked with leading advocacy organisations and the Department of Health to provide them with a lived experience perspective. Welcome, Teresa. So we're going to go straight into a panel to discussion, but I thought the first question for today would be directed primarily to Linda and Kate. To start today's discussion, can you tell us what was the catalyst for you to investigate these issues and write your report, Reparations for Harm to People Living with Dementia in Residential Aged Care? Perhaps to you to, um, first, Linda. Thanks, Verity. Uh, Kate, I don't know if you wanted to provide some of the broader context for the project. Sure, I'm happy to do that, Linda, and thank you, Verity, um, and also everyone here today to help Linda and I celebrate the launch of this important report. report. And also thanks to Leah for all of your support uh, and our speakers and attendees. Um, I think just in background, most 
of you in the Zoom room today will know that since my own diagnosis of young onset dementia, which is almost 15 years ago, um, it, it, it highlighted my the experience of rights violations and that became a catalyst for me to become an activist and then a researcher. The diagnosis of dementia clearly highlighted the denial of universal health coverage, including rehabilitation and multiple other disability and human rights violations, resulting in a prescription of disengagement from my pre-diagnosis life. So despite dementia being defined as a condition causing major disabilities by the World Health Organization for over a decade, we still have a health sector using a medicalized approach, which mostly manages the symptoms of dementia as a pathway to deficits and death, instead of as acquired disabilities which is an approach that could and should be supported to ensure people with dementia have a higher quality of life and can maintain independence for longer. This potentially also can improve uh, support for people with dementia uh, and help us to see that we need to move away from institutionalisation and segregation. So there have been some Whilst there's been some positive progress to address the systemic experiences of abuse, violence and neglect in residential aged care in Australia to improve outcomes for people with dementia over the past 20 years, 25 years, we are still facing many of the same challenges. This is highlighted by more than 20 years of formal inquiries in Australia into residential aged care, including a Royal Commission in safe, into safety quality and safety in aged care and a disability royal commission. But we find ourselves facing a situation where violations of rights and multiple forms of abuse, violence and neglect in Australian residential aged care institutions continues almost unchecked. The approach of business as usual in dementia and aged care contributes to this and recommendations from these inquiries have consistently failed to address redress and reparations of violations of human rights in aged care, also contributing to the reality that they continue to occur. This failure of the Royal Commission led me in part to this project with Linda. Whilst we consistently fail to stop violence, abuse and neglect and prevent future violations of people's human rights, we are failing all Australians and particularly those living with dementia and our care partners and families. Perpetrators of harm must be held accountable for these violations to stop now and into the future. Also the reason for this um, work that we've been doing. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Kate. And I guess just to uh, further elaborate on uh, the situation that Kate's described, um, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety documented that people living with dementia are experiencing wide ranging harms in residential aged care, including physical and sexual violence, emotional abuse, um, misuse of psychotropic medication and use of restrictive practices. And as Kate noted, these harms violate the human rights of people living with dementia, including those found in the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, being in residential aged care in the first place is itself a violation of human rights when that decision is made by others without the consent of the person living with dementia and is made in a context of lack of resources and support to live in the community. These harms have ongoing impacts on people living with dementia, causing physical and mental health to deteriorate and sometimes even causing death. Family members who have witnessed the harm and tried to intervene often in the, in the course of doing that, being positioned as a problem in the process, uh, experience grief, distress and anger. Uh, and where family members have supported uh, individuals to move into aged care in the first place, uh, often under the belief it was uh, the best or only option, they can also experience guilt and moral injury from having been involved in the circumstances that give rise to harm. And the existing justice regulatory and political systems have largely failed to recognise and redress and repair this harm and to hold perpetrators accountable. Uh, litigation is expensive and lengthy. Complaint processes are exacerbated, oh, sorry, are experienced as exacerbating trauma and lacking transparency and meaningful outcomes. 
and government inquiries, as Kate mentioned, have failed to deliver reform. The Aged Care Royal Commission did not make any recommendations for redressing past harm. Uh, now, this lack of action in the aged care context is in contrast to official responses to other institutional harm. For example, we have a national redress scheme and a national apology in relation to institutional child sexual abuse. So ultimately, we found um, what brought us to this project was that the systems that allow harm to occur um, are continuing to allow um, harm to continue to be perpetrated because there's no recognition of the systemic problem and no attempts to repair that. So our project explored reparations as one way to respond to harm in aged care and address this current justice gap. Uh, reparations for um, those who are unsure what that means are actions of making amends and of righting wrongs. And they can take various forms outside of the aged care context, including monetary payments, apologies, um, memorials, and, and truth-telling. So I was going to ask around the key findings of your report, but you really outlined them in your first responses. Is there anything else you want to add to that, Linda or Kate, in terms of key findings? Perhaps I'll add to that. Thank you, Verity. Um, there's no research or existing practices internationally on reparations for people living with dementia in residential aged care. Hence, we've been starting from scratch. We didn't want to just cut and paste from other contexts because we wanted reparations to be, to be designed by the community of people with dementia and their care partners and those that work in that area and respond to their needs and experiences. So we ran focus groups with people living with dementia and care partners and family members, as well as uh, formal advocates and lawyers to ask whether they thought that reparations are necessary and if so, what the forms and processes of reparations should be. Linda, did you any, have anything to add? Um, I guess just briefly that in speaking to um, people through the focus groups, we had um, unanimous support for the need for reparations uh, based on the failure of existing uh, systems, the justice system, complaint systems and so on. Uh, and, and also that recognition that um, if, if redress has been delivered for other groups in the face of widespread harm, that that really also needs to be brought to the aged care context uh, to ensure the equality of people living with dementia and also as a way to um, humanise them in the face of um, dehumanisation and, and then being devalued. And also um, as a way to bring about a sense of recognition of what has been occurring and also validation given the ways in which um, people living with dementia trying to speak out or care partners and family members trying to intervene it's often uh, encountered with an experience of being disbelieved and problematized and pathologized in in that so it's really about recognition and um, accountability for what has been occurring but ultimately about change as well so people told us that um apologies, uh, monetary payments, uh, anything like that will simply be tokenistic if its ultimate goal is um, short of um, a, a drive and action to actually change and transform the system. So people really recognised that we can't fix the past, um, but we can certainly learn from that and, be, um, and take meaningful concrete action to ensure that that is not going to happen in the future. So I might open up now to some of the other panellists. Um, Theresa, maybe coming to you first, why are reparations needed for people with dementia and aged care and what type of reparations would you like to see provided to those affected? Um, I, I think I actually struggle with the question, why are they needed, as in why wouldn't they be provided? It just, I, I really can't quite understand the difference between a person living with dementia being excluded and locked up and all of those things and a younger person. What, why are we different? And I, I think it's coming back to our culture of utility and this model of you're not useful. And the way I see it in the community is that older people, once they become um, a little disabled, a little infirm, are placed in the equivalent of um, cold storage. 
out of sight, out of mind. But when you've got dementia, you're in the deep freeze. We call it care. It's not. It's just keeping bodies alive. And when that goes wrong, reparations are needed because the same as anyone else in the community, we'd like to be placed back in the position we were in before the abuse. And that can take many, many forms. But one thing that's often overlooked is the need for some sort of emergency provision so that when someone's being severely abused or has been, that they can be effectively airlifted out of that horrible situation. The expectation of the community is that the person will continue to live in that room with the same staff, with everything the same, and just wait for someone to come with some cash or some sort of reparation. And it's simply not good enough to leave people in the same traumatic, frightening situation. And I think a lot of thought needs to be given to the first aid that we give to people who are in this situation and enabling people to move from one facility to another when abuse has occurred without a financial penalty. Mm, that's a really good point. Bill, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, just to say that I think that it's a good example of where we see intersectional impacts. Where I, I, I realise that not all people with dementia are older persons, uh, but where they are older persons, they are doubly invisible, but for the negative impacts that problematise them. Uh, and so I think we reparations are an important aspect in dealing with structural ageism. Uh, and, and how it intersects with ableism and, of course, with any other structural inequality. So this is very important to bring to light uh, the, the specific needs uh, of those who are living in Russia, but also to shine a light on the very specific abuses that they experience within various institutional care settings. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Verity. I'd, I'd just first like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from Daru country and pay my respects to all First Nations people present. Um, I would like to respond to that question by deconstructing the word people, because the majority of the people that we talk about who are in aged care are women. So two in three people living in aged care are women, especially when we look at the demographic above um, 80. And, and nearly 70% of residents have moderate to severe cognitive impairment. So we're looking at a cohort of very vulnerable older people, majority of whom are women, who are having to survive an aged care system which doesn't serve their needs. We know the HK Royal Commission exposed some of the horrors perpetrated in aged care. And as Theresa, you know, and, and Linda and Kate mentioned, sadly, it still continues today. You know, we have 50% of residents who are malnourished. 40,000 serious incidents reported to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission in the 2021 to 2022 financial year. And that includes about 50 sexual assaults taking place every week in HK. So it, it, it appears that demanding reparations for the harm perpetrated against people with dementia in aged care is one strategy that we should pursue. <clears throat> this is you know, absolutely necessary because the system we put in place to provide safeguards and to protect the elderly receiving aged care, we have to admit it, it's just not working. It's all set up in favor of providers, especially the large for-profit providers who've just been allowed to operate with near impunity. I mean, we just look at Bupa, for instance. At the end of 2019, half of the nursing homes run by Bupa were failing basic standards of care with 30% of them, you know, they, they were putting the health and safety of the elderly at serious risk. That's 30%. And yet those homes were allowed to continue to run because the government wasn't bold enough to close boot down. I mean, we've really created a monster that's just too big to kill. We've seen maggots growing in wounds, residents who are literally starving to death, ants crawling out of bandages, and yet 
Not a single provider has been held to account. Not one government department has been held to account. Not a single aged care executive has been held to account. Instead, providers are being protected to pursue detrimental and dangerous practices by the government through, for example, Schedule 9 of the Aged Care Act which gives immunity to providers from both criminal and civil claims for the use of restrictive practices without having obtained lawful consent. I mean, this is truly incredible and mind boggling. It means the federal government has granted aged care providers immunity from key legislation enacted by all the states and territories. And that includes immunity from consumer law, the common law crimes of unlawful restraint, assault and battery, and writs of habeas corpus. Now, if we are to consider the findings of the first national audit of psychiatric medication prevalence in aged care homes, we can see why the providers push for this. Because nearly two thirds of the residents are being prescribed psychotropic agents regularly, with more than 41% taking antidepressants, 22% antipsychotics and 22% of residents taking benzodiazepines. So in answer to the question to the type of reparations I would like to see provided to those affected, um, you know, we can refer to the UN Commission on Human Rights, which says that victims, all victims have a right to reparation. The redress must provide the range of material and symbolic benefits to victims or their families, as well as affected communities. And reparations has to be adequate, effective, prompt, and should be proportional to the gravity of the violations and the harm suffered. So financial com compensation is just one part of it. The other part, as Teresa mentions, is the settings, the practices, the ecosystem, which enables the perpetration of the violation of the rights of people with dementia. All of this should be dismantle really that's when we get real reparation yeah that's a perfect um point to lead to my next question Yumi because all of you have talked about really the fundamental structural or systemic issues we're facing you know Bill talked about structural ageism um Linda you talked about how rep when you talk to the community when they talk about rep reparations, yes, they're saying recognition, yes, they're saying accountability, but they're also saying they want reparations to lead to change. So how can reparation, reparations change systemic issues? Often reparations are individual solutions. How do we make sure that these, this call for reparations actually changes systemic issues? Who would like to go first? Linda? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Verity, and thanks to all the speakers for their um, thoughts. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, reparations can be individual in uh, responding to the impacts of past harm and to providing um, monetary payments, uh, rehabilitation, legal services, and so on to assist people in um, addressing the impacts of that harm and how it's impacting their lives and bodies and, and so on. But reparations also operate at the collective level as well uh, and can be directed towards not only looking back to what's happened but looking forward to how we um, prevent harm in the future. So that could be uh, when reparations take the form of truth-telling that can provide opportunities for uh, people to um, share their experiences of harm or, or witnessing that harm and that in itself is important in validating those experiences. Uh, as I said, in aged care, often um, people aren't believed or are problematized when they try to raise uh, issues that have occurred. But also that then provides an opportunity for the broader public and for government and aged care providers to uh, listen and um, uh, consider what, what that truth means for their own practices and their own accountability. And then... Um, relatedly to work um, together with people living with dementia as um, leaders in, in this process in designing systems that are going to um, overcome the particular problems and causes of, of harm in the past. So um, that 
truth telling it can be particularly important as a foundation for reform because it's directly linking any reform or more importantly transformation to the lessons from the past and while we do have a current situation where there is a lot of momentum in government to um, you know reform the aged care system in light of the royal commission it's not clear that that process is really um, acknowledging and engaging with uh, what has come out of the Royal Commission in terms of those past harms. If one of the main past harms is use of restrictive practices, well, what does that mean for then designing a system in the future that will actually prohibit the use of restrictive practices moving forward. Instead, we're seeing that restrictive practices are being allowed. So that's an example where um, reform is happening, but is not in a reparative framework because it's not engaging with and learning from the past as to inform um, the future change. Bill, you had a view you wanted to express? I mean, look, I think if the central tenet of the Disability Convention is deinstitutionalisation, we're still in a situation here we're in a, in a rights vacuum for older persons. Aged care is seen as an absolutely acceptable default position. Why aren't we talking about deinstitutionalisation as the driving imperative? Um, the main reason for that is that we don't have an international convention on the rights of older persons. There's no normative pressure brought to bear on member states in this regard, uh, nor does Australia have a set of national human rights standards that are enforceable by people, uh, and nor does Australia have an Aged Care Act that is based on enforceable human rights. Uh, we're told uh, that, they, that this is being developed and yet all I'm hearing is that it's watering down to a consumer rights basis. Um, and so it's, it's critical that government right now in the design of their new system, in the absence of proper normative standards, uh, take these issues very seriously. Uh, so I, I think the federal government has been very relaxed and comfortable about the situation, notwithstanding decades of inquiries, notwithstanding the issues Yumi uh, reiterated from the Royal Commission and the Commission itself. Why do we have a Commission into care and safety quality uh, when in fact the Disability Royal Commission is about violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation? Because that's driven by the, the Disability Convention. We don't have the same pressure brought to bear. Uh, so it's time that government stepped up and really embedded human rights, including the right to reparations, within a national scheme. But Kate, um, what would you yes, like to say? I'd like to add to Linda's uh, and Bill's comments, really, and Linda, particularly your comment about truth-telling. Um, during the Royal Commission into Aged Care, there was a lot of truth-telling by family members of people with dementia or people living in residential care and also by some people with dementia. Um, but there's been a follow-up harm that these people like myself have experienced because of the lack of change, because of the lack of implementation of, of any of the 148 recommendations, because of the lack of any recommendation that talked about redress or making perpetrators accountable. That's another form of harm that we're experiencing because of a Royal Commission, which is meant to make things better. Yumi, um, how do you think reparations can change systemic issues? Um, well, Verity, I, I worry that based on the current um, settings that we have, that reparations will just be written into the business model and there'll be no change because we don't see the commitment to really get to the heart of the matter in aged care. And as Bill mentioned, it is one where we really need to put the human rights of all the people at the center. We need to recognize that aged care is not a commodity and, and, it's, and it just hasn't worked to leave it up to the market to decide how best to deliver care. Um, I can bet, I think with more than my Kit Kat, that none of us on this webinar and our like-minded colleagues and aged care advocates who are online have been consulted in the drafting of the new Aged Care Act, for example. Last Friday, Green Senator Janet Rice, she brought a group of aged care advocates together in person and online, and not one of us were involved in the drafting of the new Aged Care Act. We have a situation where aged care providers have paid lobbyists. They 
you know, uh, indulge in uh, political donations. And um, they've got the system set up to suit their needs. And the people who are vulnerable, the ones in aged care, those of us who are advocating and helping um, to get their voices out there, we just don't have those resources at all. So the whole system is unfortunately uh, rigged against us at the moment. And Teresa, do you have anything to add? <laughs> I, I do. Um, from my perspective, um, residential care is looming in my future. It's certainly not um, going to be a choice for me. Um, for most older people living with dementia, it's, it's not a choice. We're funneled because of the policies on our first bill that um, on what he said, because the aged care packages for home care are so small and the supplement for dementia care is something around $16 extra a day to help support someone living with dementia in the community. It's, we can't stay in the community at a certain point in the disease trajectory. So from where I'm sitting, I see a government that is guaranteeing and underwriting a market. And that just makes me feel really ill that not only are these providers shielded and protected by things like Schedule 9, their market is effectively guaranteed by the policies and the continuation of policies that were set back in times where we had stay-at-home mums and people could afford not to work, working was a choice, and we have all of these social constructs that are no longer relevant built into the context of aged care funding, including this context that you really shouldn't have too much fun on the taxpayer dollar. And these sorts of concepts that are embedded for us means that the only way we have to, to address this is through clear, obvious and public reparations, including acknowledgement and public acknowledgement and a denial of an ability for these organizations to shield themselves from these negative consequences. So, Bill, we've all just been talking about the numerous formal inquiries that have been happening over the last two dec decades, obviously, most importantly, the Royal Commission. It's uncovered significant harm. All of these issues have been, I suppose, brought to light through these inquiries. Why hasn't there been more improvement to date? Well, I think the simple answer is that when you talk to government, you discover very quickly that the human rights of older persons is simply not a priority. Uh, it means that they don't attend uh, places like the Open Ended Working Group on Ageing to contribute to discussion around a new convention or new normative standards. Uh, they don't engage in widespread consultation about uh, where the Aged Care Act might go. Well, certainly, I've not been consulted in any way, nor have many people I know. Um, but I think, I mean, the, the, the deeper problem is that at a national level, um, we do have a commitment nationally to move with some kind of new act in a way that is so quick uh, that it will, it has to simply miss out on the key issues that we're talking about here today. Uh, it, it, it will pay, you know, tip its hat to the Royal Commission's report, which, as I've said, in itself was completely inadequate and completely deficient. It recommended only one enforceable human right, which was uh, in respect of restrictive practices. Uh, and it, it, it also cobbled together a, a hodgepodge of human rights, um, which are all about, again, uh, projecting the right to care, which of course is critical, but no emphasis on the right to not be in care in the first place, uh, the prevention of institutionalization. And you know, the CRPD committees releases guidelines on deinstitutionalization as a principal first point. Uh, this is not even really in the picture. So I, I just think it's not a priority for the federal government. Uh, and I don't know why it isn't. It should be uh, as front and centre national priority. So I'm going to move to the questions from the audience soon. But before I do that, I, I do want to ask 
how we can ensure that any actions taken to address issues faced by people with dementia are led by people with dementia and their families and care partners. And I might come to you first on that, Kate, and then to you, Teresa. I was hoping you wouldn't do that, Verity. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's quite all right. Um, I think that when I was first diagnosed with dementia, I very quickly realised that I was attending events and conferences and meetings about dementia telling me what was best for me and, and how I felt by people who didn't themselves have dementia. So that initially was what kind of inspired me to have a voice um, but still having a voice as a person with dementia is especially hard. Um, you tend to be left out of lots of meetings, particularly if you have a known different opinion on a topic. Um, so you're not just left out, sometimes actively excluded. Um, sometimes in, in the advocacy space, including in research, it's often the same voices of people with dementia, so it's not representative of the broader community. We don't have diverse reputation, representation yet of people with dementia almost anywhere um, at any meeting. Um, and I, you know, I think it's great that Teresa's going to the UN soon for the open-ended working group meeting. I've been there for the uh, conference of state parties on the CRPD and curiously found that one of the most disability disability inaccessible meetings I've ever been to. Um, so I think we just have to keep working on having a voice, but much, much more than a voice. I'm kind of tired of the old, we need to have a voice of everybody. We actually need action and change, and we need people who are causing harm to become accountable, to be made accountable. What do you think, Teresa? How can we ensure that people with dementia and their families and care partners are part of the process? Um, I, I think I have a sense that the government are quite interested in this concept. However, um, it looks like it's going to be extremely clumsy in its approach because, again, coming back to Kate, the fact that we are not designing it ourselves. And the difficulty from where I sit is that there is no framework to support through um, not a voice, equality in this conversation. And for example, when I tried to develop a framework to support consultation, to support consistent engagement of people living with dementia, the professors that saw it were so frightened by the change that they would have to implement that it was immediately not funded. It, that will never be funded when the people that are making those decisions have something to lose. And that's where we're at in this journey at the minute where we want an equal seat at the table. That will not be given to us because that involves changes of attitudes of primarily older men, unfortunately, sorry, Bill, but older men who have vested interests in inertia. And that's where I see it at the minute is trying to burst through this inertia of people who have vested interests in nothing changing is really difficult because we are individuals living with dementia, probably the most powerless cohort in Australia. Is there anyone else on the panel who wants to talk explicitly about how we ensure the voices of people with lived experience? Yumi? Um, not exactly, um, you know, to addressing it directly, just referring more to the culture around the act itself, because, um, you know, the question of how can we ensure those who are impacted the most are included, I think it can only come about when there is a general acceptance in a community of the sanctity of life and of all life regardless of your age, your gender, your sexual orientation, ethnicity, and ability. I mean, COVID has really proved the harsh truth to us, and which continues to be told to us weekly, that the lives of older people are not as important as the lives of others. And this was also shown up by the RoboDebt Royal Commission, you know, where we saw that the lives of those who are on welfare were 
were seen as less important because they are painted to be undeserving of being supported. They were painted out to be dull bludgers. And, and similarly, you know, our elderly are not seen as productive economic contributors and they're at the last stages of their lives. So there is no concerted effort to fix the system to support them. I might move, if there's no one else who wants to add to that, I might move to some of our questions from the audience. Um, Bill, I know that you were saying that no one has yet got in touch with you about the Aged Care Act, but I think it is quite a good question from Yvonne around how can we use this study to impact on the Aged Care Act? Um, we've got this piece of work now, how do we actually make sure it has an impact on the drafting that is now happening? Bill, do you want to take that first and then maybe Linda? Yeah, look, sure. Um, and I noticed that Val, Val Fells has also responded in the chat box to say that the Council of Elders is engaged in the consultations, as have many persons through the, the hub. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to differentiate between those sorts of consultations, and I don't mean you, Val, uh, but online, large-scale portal consultations. Uh, they would be an example for me that are not meaningful. Uh, I mean the opportunity to sit down with the people drafting this to make sure that they do actually have front and centre and the words are important. Um, you can talk about rights and that's a neat way of actually making sure perhaps you're not talking about human rights, perhaps you're talking about consumer rights. So the words are important. The centrepiece of the legislation has to include strong objects that are about recognising, embedding, promoting and enforcing human rights. And you also need to spell out what those rights are. It's not enough just to I'm not going to take them just on their word that it's going to be centred around those issues because I've heard that many times before and it doesn't necessarily come to fruition. So I think meaningful meaningful uh, consultation uh, with, with the words is important. That may happen through the committee process, but uh, at this stage uh, what I'm seeing is a lot of behind closed doors talks uh, that are not in the domain of the broader uh, community or even in the broader domain of some of the interest groups such as the organisation that I work for. Linda, do you have anything to add to that in terms of influencing the Act? Um, I guess just to note that there's probably a lot we can learn from other contexts, such as, say, the NDIS legislation that that says that it's um, about upholding human rights, but it, but then in its substantive provisions goes on to allow all kinds of things, such as, you know, the funding of um, services that allow segregation and, and violence through restrictive practices. Um, so I think that going to Bill's point about human rights being meaningful in legislation, it's not enough to just simply refer to a convention or come out with a blanket statement that, you know, this legislation will further human rights. If that, if there's no alignment between those general statements and substantive provisions that are actually about how aged care services are going to be provided, then they're completely meaningless uh, and they undermine the potential of, of human rights. So if, um, and um, so if aged care legislation is still allowing restrictive practices, is still allowing institutionalisation and segregation and discrimination, then any statement about human rights is uh, completely false and is simply there to try to placate people. And just as another note, the um, government is currently developing a national action plan on dementia and that contains no reference to human rights. So that's kind of one uh, even more aggressive compared to any aged care legislation, but goes to this idea that uh, it's, it's really not a priority for government and it's not really a way in which we're framing the issue. And I just wanted to flag, sorry, before you um, go to the questions, Verity, before I um, miss the opportunity, I just wanted to thank um, the um, project partners, people, um, uh, people with Disabilities Australia and Dementia Alliance International and our advisory group members um, and all of the research participants that spoke to us um, going to that question about how we include um, people, involve people living with dementia in change. Um, we're trying to make this report and the projects part of that change. And we really, Kate and I really acknowledge the weight of responsibility we have having spoken to so many people and heard their experiences and, and what they want. So um, yeah, so we certainly acknowledge that and hope that we can 
so one way in which we can show that they have been included in the research is to follow through and continue to advocate for these issues. Yeah. So the next, one of the questions which has a large amount of upvotes, so I feel I should follow democracy, is from Amanda Crombie, who wants to know what actions can we take as a community to hold perpetrators to account? She goes on to say that she's spent the last decade and a half observing ongoing harms being perpetrated against people living with dementia and voicing my concerns into a chasm. Residential aged care in my community is so beyond acceptable, I hold the view that those living with dementia who need support are better off staying at home and doing the best they can do on their own because they, at least they will not have others causing them harm. So this is really around actions that we can take as a community to hold perpetrators to account. Who would like to talk about that first? Yumi? Um, thank you, Verity. I think the question is an excellent one. And I think it speaks to how we see ourselves as a nation and each one of us being active participants in shaping the type of country that we want to live in. And um, uh, we have to, I think, join groups you know, be part of collective action. Individually, we can do so little, but collectively, we can do a lot more. We can use our collective voices and power to effect change. I think it is important for all of us to be more active in, in, in getting change to happen. And um, it, it is absolutely massive. You know, the HK industry generates millions in, in profits for um, providers and um, they will not let go of this so easily. And uh, we, we really need uh, concerted action. And, you know, we have advocates on this line who have been at, on this issue for decades. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, they would... Um, like to see change happen sooner rather than later. So I think um, we as advocates need to find a, a, a way where we can harness our collective power to do to do more. I think, uh, you know, where, where do we start? You know, there is also the media, which is controlled by uh, certain elements that drive certain narratives and, um, you know, so everything is so interconnected. You know, the people living with dementia who are suffering in uh, aged care facilities are an integral part of our community and fixing things for them will fix a lot of other things for others as well in the community. It's so often the case, isn't it? Does anyone else want to talk about community pressure? Yeah, I'd quite like to, Verity. I, I think that we have a challenge in getting the community to engage in the need for things like reparations or accountability of violence, abuse and harms in residential aged care because apart from news stories, most people don't really believe it happens. It's that old, it happens to other people's family but it wouldn't happen to mine. Um, and so many people in the community have been uh, active in placing someone they love and care for into an aged care facility. So to face up to the fact that, that the person you love is being abused, and I've done that, I've had to do that, is really confronting. So sometimes there's a bit of a, we need to bury our head in the sand, partly because there's no other alternative accommodation for people with dementia who need to be in some sort of assisted living environment. So currently in almost all states, the only option we've got is large institutional settings which are segregated and locked. So there's a lack of awareness in the community, community about what we need to change. Mm. Bill? I just wanted to um, let people know that there's some building momentum with a group called Rights of Older Persons Australia, uh, or ROPA, and that includes uh, many, many peak bodies who work in this area. Uh, particularly around older persons' interests, not just across aged care. Uh, so there are there are certainly um, organisations that are mobilising around this issue, um, but unfortunately, the members of the general public still haven't really moved like they should. 
uh, notwithstanding what they saw in the Four Corners and in the, in the Commission. So I think we need to make sure people know about the issue as well um, and understand just how dire it can be for some people because you know, it's a, awareness is critical to the, to the moving forward. Teresa, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I probably will echo everyone else's suggestions and frustration with that. It is really difficult to um, to combat the fear that we all have. We, you know, we all know someone who's had a bad experience in residential aged care and the guilt and the pain. And because it's a round robin situation, because there isn't acknowledgement and because there isn't reparation, we know it's a dead end and you just sort of do the bury your head because it's just all too much. But again, our voices together combined may make some change and it's probably the best thing. If maybe if as a group we can put out an email or some sort of circulation of some groups that are worthwhile joining that will give us a voice that have interest in this. I think that might be a really good start. So I'm going to ask one more question from the audience and then a final question of my own. The question from the audience um, is from Anthony Brown, and he makes the point that it's not just the aged care sector that harms people with dementia. Dementia. How do we draw other sectors such as health? Sorry, so it moved on me. I think it just got taken off. It's... <laughs> It got answered. Anyway, I can now read it to you. Um, how do we draw other sectors, such as healthcare, into this discussion on accountability and reparation? I thought that was a good point. So it's not just the aged care sector. It's, it's obviously an intersection with other government agencies and services. Um, who would like to have a stab at this one? How do we draw other sectors into this conversation? Bill? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, human rights are indivisible and interconnected and, and inalienable. So if we provide people with proper human rights, then it shouldn't matter what the setting or placing is. Uh, they should be able to access the same rights irrespective of their setting. So for me, universality of human rights is the critical point here. And Linda, what would you like to say? Yes, just that um, our project, did, we obviously there was a lot of focus on uh, the role of aged care providers and, and a, the boards and managers of aged care facilities, but uh, people also spoke about the importance of accountability and um, repair in, in relation to healthcare providers, uh, particularly if they are involved in restrictive practices and forced medication, uh, and also the legal profession as well, because, and as a, a member of the legal profession, I certainly recognise the role of law in this, not only because so, you know, most of what happens is completely legal, which shows the way in which um, the legal system and lawyers and judges and so on are complicit in this process uh, and practice, but also um, because uh, at an individual level, restrictive practices, um, forced movement into aged care and so on is enabled by guardianship law, restrictive practice laws and so on. So I think we've got to really, yeah, take a broad approach to the various professions that are uh, complicit or implicated in um, these practices and look um, at prof engaging professional associations, unions, uh, and also the universities as well, because if a lot of this, um, what's happening is considered ethical and legal, you know, we've got a lot to be accountable for in the university sector for what we teach and the kind of knowledge we generate that provides a foundation for these practices to occur. So that's about how we, who we, um, how we're approaching our teaching of future professionals, the kind of research we do, and um, thinking about yeah, accountability in academia as well. Yes, that's a very good point. All right. Well, there's five minutes to go, so I'm just going to ask my final question of each of the panelists. I will say that Philippa Carnamola has said a very nice. Um, uh, message in the Q&A, um, thanking us for raising the importance of inclusive practices. We can learn from inclusive practices in other sectors, including research policy led by people with intellectual disability. This webinar is a call to action that inclusive practice is critical in research in this area. And I think that that's spot on. So my final question to everyone is a positive question, hopefully ending on a little bit of a 
higher note, which is what do you hope will change with the information made available through this new research? And of course, the accompanying campaign for dementia justice. And I might start with you, Yumi. What do you hope will change? Oh, well, I thank Linda and Kate for this research because it really highlights the fact that we have a very vulnerable group of people whose rights for safety and care are being violated on a daily basis. If we flip the age groups and if it were children in school who are being neglected and abused in this manner, there's no question that heads would roll. You know, the Aged Care Royal Commission stated that about 39% of residents are abused. So if 39% of children in our schools are being abused in a similar manner, what do you think will happen? So I think this research enables us to stop and interrogate why we are not collectively outraged. And I'm hoping the campaign will lead to better staffing. And by, by this, I mean both in terms of training and numbers for aged care, because people don't go into aged care as a lifestyle choice. They go to aged care because they can't care for themselves anymore. It means they really need assistance provided by trained staff. And that includes training on the specific needs of people with uh, dementia. And the poor understanding of dementia can be seen in the fact that aged care staff believe that in 58% of cases of sexual assault, there is no impact on the victim. And just this morning in the Sydney Morning Herald, there was the news article about an 83-year-old woman with dementia who was not believed when she reported three times about being sexually assaulted. The facility manager said something like, that would never happen here because she knows all the staff. It's time to upgrade our knowledge base, our compassion, and our resolve to get things right for some of the most vulnerable people in our country. Thank you, Yumi. Linda, what we, what do you hope will change? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I guess I hope that we will have uh, more recognition of the need to take a sim the kind of approach that we've taken in other contexts, such as with the National Redress Scheme, uh, National Apologies and so on, in the context of aged care and for people living with dementia and to stop having a situation where the human rights, the justice um, available to people living with dementia is um, substandard or non-existent. And also, though, um, really looking at our mainstream justice processes, um, just as much as people living with dementia should be equal in terms of accessing specialised reparations, they should also have equal access to justice through our courts and complaint processes. So those really need to be uh, fixed as well. Thanks, Linda. Teresa, what would you like to change? Um, well, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this report will bring some attention. In the community, we've got sort of this sense of security that we live in the West. Uh, we have human rights, and if someone is harmed, that, you know, that harm is addressed. And we have this sense that everything's okay. This brings us to a really pain point where we realise there is a part of our community that are not being treated fairly. And... So by the time that we encounter that in our own lives, we have this information say, actually, that's not fair. And I can point to this report to show you why it's not fair. So this is, if anything, it's giving us a little bit of ammunition so that when we come to that point in our own lives, when it's our own family member that's affected, we have a little tiny bit of a shard of something to begin that individual fight that whatever proportion of us here today will have to fight when it comes to our own time. Bill? Well, I hope that people living with dementia become visible rights bearers as opposed to invisible objects of charity. Uh, that's, I think if this can help along that way, then that's, that's a big help. Wonderful. And last but not least, Kate? Um, thanks, everyone, for such great sort of final comments about what you would like. I would really like to see the law changed in so many areas so that there aren't loopholes for aged care providers who aren't providing adequate care, for example, poor nutrition um, or, you know, no oral, oral hygiene. I would like to see some legislation changed so that, that people are made accountable for that. Um, but also when you look at the vulnerability of people with dementia it's not just an Australian issue it's absolutely global and you know anecdotally all of the work that I've been doing around the world um, with people with dementia or attending events 
it's the same problem, just a different reason for the problem. But generally, it's the marginalisation, the paternalism, and that everybody without dementia knows best for people with dementia, not themselves. Mm. Well, thank you to our panel. You've been absolutely wonderful today. We really appreciate your time to talk to our audience. Thank you to the audience for attending. Um, we've had a wonderful um, participation throughout this session. So thank you. Everyone who registered for this session will also receive a link with a recording. So please share it far and wide. That could be part of the campaign for dementia justice. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next time.